Just so you know, all the music from this video is now up for free on my Bandcamp, the link of which will be in the pinned comment below and in the description. On the morning of the 21st of September 2001, the people of Toulouse, France, had no reason to suspect anything out of the ordinary could happen. Life was passing by just like any other Friday. Although many are still in shock from the events that unfolded just 10 days before in New York City. However, Toulouse seemed like a million miles away from the tragedy. But the usual hustle and bustle would be blown apart. At 10.17 in the morning, an explosion rang out from the outskirts of the city. The initial fear in the public eye would be that maybe France was a target for some kind of terrorist attack. But no. What of the cause then? Well, that's what we'll be looking at in today's video. My name is John and welcome to Plainly Difficult. Today we're looking at the AZF fertilizer explosion in Toulouse, France. This video wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for my YouTube, Patreon and Ko-fi members. If you like early access and add free access to the videos on this channel, you can from just £1 a month. As always, the details will be in the pinned comment below. AZF. This is the Azolt Fertilisant Fertilizer Plant in southern Toulouse, France. The city has a population of, in 2001, just over a million people. The plant is roughly three kilometers away from the city centre. And if you know anything about fertilizer, then you would know some types can be a little bit explosive. Which makes the location seem a little bit dangerous, shall we say. But the plant had been on its site since 1924, and back then I can imagine the area was much less built up. Over the years, the site would change owners, being taken over by Grande Parisi in 1991. The site would produce hundreds and hundreds of tonnes of products per year. The site by the early 2000s employed over 400 staff, and as stated by a French Ministry of Sustainable Development report, has an annual turnover in order of 100 million euro. The report also says about the site that the plant has two main activities, the fabrication of nitrogen fertilizer and industrial nitrates, and the synthesis of chlorine-containing compounds. A key ingredient in the creation of fertilizers is ammonium nitrate, and the AZF site is no different. The plant produces anhydrogenous ammonia by reacting hydrogen and nitrogen at elevated temperatures and pressures in the presence of an iron catalyst. Once the ammonia is produced, the important ammonium nitrate is created by reacting the ammonia with nitric acid. The resulting ammonia nitrate is taken for production for fertilizer. Now the site understandably would need to store loads of chemicals. This was done via two cryogenic ammonia banks, one 350 ton pressurized ammonia storage tank, two 56 tonne liquid chlorine tankers, 15,000 tonnes of oxidants, 15,000 tonnes of solid ammonium nitrate in bulk form, and on top of all of that, another 2,500 tonnes of methanol. All the storage was spread out throughout the site. Due to the presence of so many dangerous goods, the site was regularly assessed via danger studies starting in 1982, with its final one being conducted in 2001. During the assessments, various scenarios were analysed and this was all under the EU Cervezio directives, which came about after the big balls up in Italy, which I have a video already about, which you can check out later on. Inspections are undertaken regularly as well, in which the storage is checked to be up to standard. One of the places that was checked was Shed 221, placed near the northern section of the site. It was responsible for the storage of certain types of ammonium nitrate. This was agricultural or industrial nitrate graded as below grade, due to abnormalities such as grain size or off-spec chemical composition. The shed were licensed for 500 tonnes of material storage. The shed stores this unwanted waste material until it is removed for recycling at other facilities around France. But whilst the contents of the shed sat awaiting removal, they would be stored alongside the bagging building, which contained more ammonium nitrate, albeit non-rejected. As a random side, apparently the buildings that made up Shed 221 were built during the 1920s, meaning that by 2001 they were nearly 80 years old. 
and it was not equipped with a fire detection system. Now we've had a quick dive into the site, let's have a look at the disaster. The disaster. It is the 20th of September 2001 and Shed 221 is getting 15 to 20 tonnes of ammonium nitrate products being added to its storage, of which the building has at this moment between 300 and 400 tonnes stored within. The next day, the 21st of September, saw more products being entered into the shed throughout the morning. At around 10.10 10 in the morning, a worker in the bagging room left the shed, seeing nothing particularly out of place. At this moment, there are 266 plant employees and a further 100 subcontractors working on site. At 10.17 in the morning, a massive explosion ripped out of Shed 221. The shockwave was felt for up to 50 miles around, even hitting parts of the city centre of Toulouse. A massive cloud rose out of the explosion, raising contaminated dust towards the northwest. The explosion caused the shutdown of other operations near the site. Now this cloud of smoke was high in content of ammonia, and anyone who came into contact with it reported eye and throat irritation. Loads of properties were damaged from the explosion, ranging from severe structural damage down to just a few cracked or broken windows, which would have an estimated insurance cost of 1.5 billion euro. Interestingly, two thirds of the city's windows were damaged, causing nearly 100 reported eye injuries. A crater 7 metres or 23 feet deep with a diameter of 40 metres or 130 feet was created. The explosion was rated at 3.4 on the Richter scale and had an estimated yield of some 20 to 40 tonnes of TNT. Pollutants entered the Garonne River from nitric acid runoff. Fire and emergency workers were quick to attend the site, helping evacuating the wounded. In the initial explosion, 29 people were killed, with two more dying of their wounds in hospital later on. Nine of the dead weren't even working on site and were, in all other intensive purposes, civilians. 30 more would be severely injured, with 21 remaining in hospital for more than one month after the explosion. 2,500 more people would also require medical treatment of some sort of type. The damage for the surrounding industrial district was severe, with two of the site stacks being collapsed after the blast. The metal fragments from the metal structure of the shed were found nearly a mile away. Multiple vehicles in a nearby bus garage were completely decimated. Luckily, however, some of the more vulnerable storage areas were protected from further explosions, mainly due to a number of larger buildings being in between Shed 221, which took most of the brunt of the explosion. The chemicals that leaked into the river were quickly sealed off, further preventing more contamination and water dousing was used to dilute the chemical runoff. The destruction, both economical and environmental, was significant. It would take several months to make the AZ site safe. This mainly consists of removing dangerous materials and clearing the ground of residual contamination, a lot of which had been buried under rubble from the blast, which had to be removed first and then disposed of. Understandably, this costs several million euro to do in the addition to the massive insurance payout. In the aftermath, the cause was obviously an interest to everyone concerned, which neatly leads us on to the investigation. The investigation. Now, as soon as the dust settled, concerns over the explosion being a terrorist attack were pretty prevalent. I mean, it's an easy assumption to make, just being under two weeks after 9-11. Initially, a French national of Tunisian descent named Hassan Jandoui was highlighted as a potential perpetrator in the terrorist theory. He was known to local police as having Islamic fundamentalist sympathies, with multiple reports of him confronting his co-workers for displaying US flags in solidarity with the US post 9-11, bearing in mind that this all had just been a few days post the Twin Towers falling. Jambodi had been hired by a subcontracting firm to work on site just five days before the blast. And on the day of the blast, he was working just 30 yards away from Shed 221. Autopsy of his body found post-blast him to be wearing multiple layers of clothes, and as stated in the Guardian newspaper, as of the apparel worn by some Islamic militants going into battle or on suicide missions. This was from the pathologist that was conducting the autopsy. 
Although interviews with his girlfriend said that he often wore multiple layers of clothes due to his concern over being seen as too skinny. She had also completely cleared out the flat before the police were able to search it, which on the other hand does sound pretty sus. But little else was found in the way of evidence beyond him having a phone with a stolen SIM card. Nothing properly tied him to the blast apart from the circumstantial evidence. The next main theory, which would be the one that the official report would settle on, was that of an accidental chemical reaction. It was theorised that some sodium dichlorocyanurate had been spilled on the main pile inside Shed 221, just 20 minutes before the main explosion. This caused a reaction that released gaseous nitrogen trichloride, a highly unstable and explosive gas, which then ignited. And as we know, although stable, ammonium nitrate once heated up gets pretty explosive -y. and thus disaster is assured. Post-accident, the site would limp on slowly being dismantled, turning from an industrial site to the site of a solo voltaic power plant and what looks like on Google Maps a bit of scrubland. And I'm sure the Google Earth car here turned around pretty quickly. The AZF's parent company, Grande Perosi, and the plant manager were charged with involuntary homicide and injuries in 2006 after the official report release. The charges led to a civil trial run between the 23rd of February and 30th of June 2009, resulting in a €225,000 fine against the company and a €45,000 fine plus three years superventive imprisonment order against the plant manager. The explosion at the AZF plant highlights a common issue with industrial zones in which resident and non-industrial commercial areas are allowed to build up right up to the boundaries of areas which deal with very dangerous goods. The fencing and security aimed at preventing theft offer no defence against an explosion. No greater example was that of one of the off-site victims was a student in college far detached from working in a risky chemical plant environment. It's a problem that we also have here in the UK, as more and more land is needed for a growing population. And often hemmed in by the green belt, you have things like this power station in South London being mere metres away from housing. By the way, the power plant burns non-recyclable household waste for energy. Just imagine the air quality. I mean, I have actually walked past here a couple of times, and the smokestacks don't leave me with a very healthy feeling. I don't know what's more toxic, this or Millwall Football Club. Anyway, enough about South London, it's scale time. It's going to be a free and this is what I've got for my root cause analysis card. Do you agree? Please let me know in the comments below. This is Plain Different Production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike licensed. Plain Different videos produced by me, John, in a currently quite frosty corner of Southern London, UK. And all I have to say is thank you very much for watching. And Mr. Music, please do me a favour and play me out, please.